Okay. So, Seth Kybel, welcome. This is something came from Baltimore. Hi, Tom. Good to be <laughs> here again. It's it's great to, to have you on this project. You're my first one. And you are more... Um, you're the one that, to really, like, talk to because uh, uh, I'm really close to watching how you work and what you do. And uh, you know, instead of talking about your latest recording, which we can talk about in the intro uh, <laughs> or the outro. Uh, we're talking about how to make it in the business. I, I mentioned that it takes 30% music, like to uh, be proficient at music and 70% having your eyes and ears on the business. I may be wrong on that percentage, but it seems like you you need that business side and not to beat you up and also to, to be on track with it. So uh, I have a lot of questions and first, uh, off, you know, where the, you know, you went to college locally here. Did, did you feel like when you went into college, like, Hey, I'm, this is totally going to work out. Um, I mean, well, look, I, I went, actually went to, uh, college up in, uh, upstate New York, Cornell university. And I searched through the course catalog and found the two most useless majors I could come up <laughs> with, which was music and American studies. Uh, which left me well qualified upon graduation to do absolutely nothing. Uh, but, you know, Cornell, even though it's a very big school, had a relatively small music department uh, when I was there. So the music major was basically a sequence of music theory, a sequence of music history, some performance credits. That's it. As far as the business side of thing, zilch, yep. nothing. Um, I didn't learn that in a classroom. I learned that from, you know, experience working with people and having a lot of informal mentors and role models early in my music career who, who I could learn this stuff from. But as far as learning it in a formal setting, uh-uh, that didn't happen, at least not with me. <clears throat> my, my degree is radio and TV production. So, you know, that was the boom of the 80s with the um, three-quarter inch tapes and all that stuff. Sure. Everyone wanted to, everyone wanted to be it. MTV just opened up. So they're the very last class that they said, they brought us all in. It was a big auditorium. They said, it's very possible that you're not going to get a job in this field. You know? And I wish they would have yeah. told me that four years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's oh, why. By I, the way. <laughs> yeah. It, it's very unlikely that uh, they said the percent, they said one out of maybe 12 will be in this business. Well, and look, that, it's probably... I mean, it's like a lot of the music schools today, and I don't, I don't mean to be poo-pooing them. They're great, and they're great programs, uh -huh. but to a large extent, they produce very talented, unemployable musicians who then end up becoming teachers to teach future generations of talented yet unemployable musicians. <laughs> In this conversation, it seems to me that to be – like the Quan, you know, like if you were in gov local government, then you got a good paycheck and you're good. You can take a breather and say, I look, at least I know I'm getting paid well. But as a musician, if you're a teacher at, say, at a university or something, to me, that's the highest pinnacle. At least you know you got your money coming in. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. So, okay, that I'm not wrong by saying that. Uh, so if you don't have that going on, you're, you're stressing. So when did... When did it hit you that, hey, it's just me and my talent and my grit that I got to like kind of hustle on this? I mean, I think, you know, I started playing in, you know, professional and semi-professional bands uh, when I was just a teenager with people a lot older than me. So I kind of learned from their example, you know, and I learned early on, oh, you got to promote, you got to do this, you got to do that, you know. If you're going to be a, an independent musician, uh, yeah, you're going to spend most of your time doing non-musical things. It would gr it'd be great to be an ivory tower artist and spend all day just working on music and on my craft. Uh, and maybe if you're like a super talented musician, you know, the t top of the top, you get in a position where you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, you know, 98% of us, that's not just... Uh, the reality. I mean, you said 70, 30 might be 80, 20 might be 85, 15. I spend far more time doing the business end of things, promotion, advertise, booking, 
networking, you know, paperwork, set lists, contracts, you know, all that stuff than I do actually practicing. And look, it's frustrating. And I hear a lot of musicians complain about it on a regular basis, but it's just a reality. So it's not even worth complaining about because it's just it's just how it works uh especially in this day and age if you're going to be a musician or at least an independent musician you know not playing in an orchestra or in a military band or some kind of full established organization you're gonna have to spend a lot of time uh doing things on the business side of things and um you know i i used to complain more about it i still don't enjoy it but it's just a reality and that, you know, 80% of my time enables me to do the 20% that I love, you know, and, and, and in, in just trying to put a positive spin on things, for me at least, being a musician is the best job in the world. I love it. When I'm playing, when I'm on stage, I don't care how small the stage is and how small the audience is, I'm like, I am the luckiest guy in the world. I am doing what I love. So if it takes, you know, hours and hours of paperwork and drudgery and calling people and doing things that I find distasteful, hey, that's a small price to pay. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like this podcast. You know, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Love to, love to interview you. Love talking to you all the time. But the, it takes about 10 hours to do 20 minutes of this podcast and then, you know, weeks. Yeah to promote it and get it out there so people can see it. And that's the part you're like, okay, wow. So you, right now you're, you are more or less in the tri-state area. You work with how many bands would you say that you're involved or you have access to or. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, as I like to say, I'm musically promiscuous. Uh -huh. So I've got a bunch <laughs> of different groups of my own, of various shapes and sizes, you know, jazz. I do some klezmer. I do, I do a lot of different types of music, but then I freelance with other people. I mean, I would say about half my gigs, I'm the leader. You know, it's my band. I'm the guy in charge. And about half my gigs, I'm a side person. I'm working with someone else, uh, all different band leaders. So, I mean, you know, when I, at the end of the year, when I get those 1099s in, I get about, you know, literally about 50, 60, 1099s uh, that I got to go through. Um, you know, uh, I was just doing, uh, not, not to go down this rabbit hole, but I was just doing financial aid forms for my son. who's going to be going to college next year. And like, for one of them, they're like, please scan and send any 1099s. You know, you got, I'm like, are you kidding? I got a stack of 1099s this big. So I, I scanned and sent them all. <laughs> what, uh, that's another story where you have two kids. They're, yep. they're two musical kids. You, um, when you have a wife, so you've been together for a long time. She's adorable. I saw pictures on Facebook. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, you, you know, you're creating a whole, like, I think, I think going back into it, the reason I didn't stay in, in, uh, um, uh, the entertainment field is that I needed to make money. I kind of dropped out because I was like, I gotta, yeah. I gotta take care of my business. Where if I trudged along, I may have been able to hit those connections earlier and may have stayed in that business. I think if I uh, didn't step backwards, I may have went forwards, I'd say. But in your case, you have kids, you have family. Uh, how is that in your mind that, hey, I got a, I got a fluid business where if that ebbs and flows and how do I like you know, to the healthcare and how do I yeah. get all that stuff done? And how do I get, you know, how do I keep the machine rolling, the family machine? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough for independent, you know, self-employed people like myself. I mean, uh, because as you point out, income is not predictable. Like, I mean, you know, when the pandemic hit, my income dropped pretty seriously. I was able to pick up some of the slack through online teaching and virtual programs, but that certainly didn't pick up all the slack. So yeah, you don't know. It's feast or famine. You don't know how much you're going to make. Now, I'm a little bit m more fortunate than many in that, uh, my, uh, you know, my spouse has a, has a decent job. She doesn't make, I mean, I probably make just as much money as her, but it has benefits. So yes. that's, that's a big plus. I don't have to worry about health insurance for me 
or the kiddos. And, you know, I don't want to get too political, but that's one of the things that, that at least is a little bit better for independent artists now is because of Obamacare. You know, when I was first starting out, um, uh, um, you know, if I hadn't gotten married fairly young, I would have had serious problems with health care. Because I, I, I have a few pre-existing conditions. Nothing that serious. But I know because I tried, I would have been completely unable to get insurance, health insurance before Obamacare. I mean, I would have had to find someone and marry them out of convenience uh, in order to get health care uh, back then. Uh, so, I mean, healthcare is definitely still an issue and still a problem uh, for independent musicians, but at least now there are a few more options. Look, the, the American economy is not set up to encourage people to be self-employed. The way the healthcare system, the way the tax system, the way all of it is set up, it incentivizes you to go work for someone else to go work for a company. And that's, you know, that's a larger discussion. That's an issue for a whole nother day. Uh, but if you are going to be an independent, uh, you know, uh, your, your own employer, an independent artist, independent, whatever, independent podcaster, um, there are some serious financial obstacles. What I, I can imagine, I, I can imagine what is the, what, what's the opportunity like right now you you're in the tri-state area so you basically know yeah, every yeah. every single place that you would play uh you're permit probably familiar with the foundations that yeah that are yeah. doing like summer like gigs that are looking for for talent um uh, that you have a portfolio of type of material so you're targeted how does how does someone like get that set up like are you are you basically i, I mean i always look at uh jazz and it always talks about mentors where you know you you just follow along and with someone yeah. who's more seasoned and they're willing to show you the ropes that that you wouldn't get in school at all you know yeah i mean look you know when i started playing professionally you know 25 years ago as i said you know i was working with people much older and much more experienced than me i wasn't a band leader at first i mean my first you know five, six, seven years as a musician, I was entirely working as a sideman with other people. And even after that, you know, I still did more sideman gigs than gigs under my own name. So I was learning from all these people. Uh, and I had a lot of informal mentors along the way. Look, uh, just an example, you may, did you, are you familiar with Daryl Davis? Have you ever interviewed him? No. You should if you haven't. Um, I can put you in touch. I mean, he's a, a brilliant musician, boogie woogie blues pianist. Um, you know, he was Chuck Berry's pianist for the last couple of decades of Chuck's life. He did, he's worked with a gazillion big names. Um, and I played in his band for quite a few years at the end of the nineties, early two thousands. We're still close friends, but back then we were, you know, he was touring all the time. We used to do four or five gigs a week. I, I did, uh, four different European tours with him. Um, and I picked up a lot from him just, just by watching him, just by examples, just by mm -hmm. adding questions, uh, asking questions. Um, there's been a lot of people like that. I mean, I think that's how it works almost in any business. So even though I never got any instruction in the music business, you know, in a formal setting, in a classroom or, or what have you, uh, I sure got a lot of instruction in the music business, mm -hmm. uh, from a lot of people I've worked with. And then you do a lot of education on your own, you know, a lot of reading, a lot of, I mean, these days I spend a lot of time online. You know, I'm always reading articles and blogs and listening to podcasts and, you know, trying to keep up on what's going on and new trends and new venues and new festivals and who's doing what. Um, you know, that process, that process of trying to learn never ends and don't even get me started on technology and trying to keep <laughs> up with all that. That's uh yes. that's almost a losing battle. But uh um that was yeah. one of my questions of the future. So when you get into contracts, okay, have you ever signed a contract that you're like, oh wow, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just signed a contract or do you feel like they're pretty you know at this stage you're pretty cut and dry? I mean look like almost anything, you know how many people read all the terms and conditions before you click that agree box online? Um, 
when when I get contracts, you know, I mean, I definitely look them over. Uh, but if it's from someone I know, someone I trust, I don't go over it with a fine tune tooth comb. I don't argue over every little thing. Look, a lot of places, you know, have kind of standard legal language the lawyers make them put in. I'm fine with that. Look, I mean, just as an example, uh, you know, if I'm playing a gig at the Kennedy Center, they send a contract that's like 20 pages long, you know, and there's so much fine print. Uh, and I, you know, skim it. But look, I know the people who are hiring me. I've known them for years. They're good people. I'm not really that worried about, you know, every last word and every last clause in that contract. So I'll skim it and I'll sign it and I'll send it back. <laughs> the uh... I know I know somewhere there's like, you know, a horde of lawyers listening to this podcast right now are twitching <laughs> to hear me say that. <laughs> the the uh, I believe that uh because things have changed in the last, I'd say uh 2006 2000 by 2010 you know uh, labels and and the relationship with labels are have completely changed but i believe that people who buy music or go to shows think that you're signed by a label they're taking care of you they're they're um setting up kind of all your concerts they're yeah. you know someone someone's working with you and and uh when you do a label at your level what kind of involvement like out of yeah than, i mean let, let, let me address several things. So, I mean, yes, if you're if you're an A-list artist, which I am not, <laughs> you've got a team working for you and a team of people who know what they're doing and you can sit back and just, you know, work on your music and trust them to do, take care of the business end of things. If you are not the tippity top of the heap, and I'm really talking that elite, you know, 1%, less than 1% of musicians, uh, you got to do a lot of it yourself. Now, do I have people who help me out with stuff? Sure. You know, I have some gigs that get booked through agents where an agent gets me the gig and stuff. Uh, a lot of them I book myself. So it's a, it's a mixture. Um, but, you know, you, like I said, unless you're, unless you're one of those A-listers, unless you're a marquee name, uh, you're going to still end up doing a lot of stuff yourself. Now, as far as the labels thing, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Now, look, technically, I'm on a label. It's a small independent label based in Tacoma Park, Maryland, called Azalea City Recordings. It's great, but it's an artist-run label, meaning it, we kind of do some collective promotion. We help each other out. Uh, there are definitely advantages to being in that collective. It gives us a little bit of cachet. I, I do say I'm on a record label. Um, but I still have to do almost all of the work myself. Uh, all of us on the label do. It's not a label like, you know, you walk into the big office and there's a guy with a cigar who makes all the deals for you and picks up the phone and it's done. And, and I think that's the ca case with most artists today. Unless you're literally, you know, uh, someone who's internationally known, uh, you're going to end up doing most if not all of the work yourself or at yeah. least your small little team um and you know I wish it weren't true but it's just a reality and and i'm fine with that like i said do you get frustrated like right now i'm doing the r&b divas so i did the r&b teddy bears most yeah. of them went viral they were great they were like my biggest thing so i'm so excited about unleashing the divas i'm paying money for facebook ads i'm I'm, I'm promoting more than ever. I'm looking at the numbers and they suck or they're not where I want them to be. So, uh, you know, so the, the, the clicks, the likes, the, the views, the, uh, the seats, filling the seats, like, how does that like work with your head? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it can be, uh, it can be, uh, a, it can be very stressful. First of all, as you well know, yeah. uh, you know, anytime you're trying to, you need some kind of external validation, it can be very stressful. Um, I kind of joke most everything I do uh, in the music business ends up not succeeding as well as I had hoped, but not failing as bad as I had feared. <laughs> you know, almost every project I've been involved in, every release, every album ends up somewhere in between. Um, you know, doing well enough, I'm like, okay, that's not too bad. 
I'm happy with that. I'll take that. That's not a complete flop. Uh, but you know, never, you know, you know, exploding the way I would hope in my dreams. Um, but that's tough. And you got to keep your eyes on the big picture. You know, there's a tendency, I know some musicians and it's very easy to fall into this trap where your entire mood, your entire outlook, your entire psychological well-being is based on the last gig or last project, you know? I mean, again, I, I used to work with one musician, I'm, you know, no point mentioning names, I'm not going to, but, you know, if he played a bad gig, suddenly, completely down in his whole music career, you know, this is terrible, I'm gonna quit, I need to do something, and then when he played a good gig, you know, suddenly supercharged again. No, you gotta, you gotta have a bigger picture. There are gonna be good big gigs. There are gonna be bad gigs. You know, I have shows where I get great turnout, hundreds of people. People love it. I sell a gazillion CDs. You know, standing ovation. Yes. And then I play, you know, gigs for mostly empty rooms for whatever reason. A bad booking wasn't promoted properly. Bad scheduling, and. Uh, you have to try, and it, it's a challenge sometimes. It's a challenge for me, too, uh, to keep your eye on the overall picture. I'm sure it's the same with you. You know, you do a project, you do a podcast, and it's like, oh, my God, no one listened to this last one. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to just keep going because the next one may do better and probably yeah. will do better. Um, you know, and then by the same token, when you have a good one, you know, oh man, this one got a gazillion likes and shares. You can't be like, okay, I don't have to promote anymore. I'm good now. No, because then the next one may be a flop. You know, yeah. it's it's a never ending struggle. So psychologically, you got to keep your eye on the long game. You got to keep your eye on the big picture and not let your outlook, your mood be defined by the latest success or failure the you pivoted well for covid uh i saw you you brought out your kids yeah. you were you were playing in the living room uh you were doing a lot of free shows i was watching uh that was a really trying time for a lot of musicians it's still yeah. uh, it's still a lot of trying times because some of the venues closed they're not healthy financially and you know uh people are running out of their their pandemic money they just don't there's things going on Oh yeah, well, no, no, we're not we're not out of it yet. No, not at all. And you know, each and then the the each bullet that flies in Baltimore means one less person coming to a show. You know, the, the people feel a little unsafe, yep, yep. you know, going down North Charles Street, which is traditionally a beautiful, wonderful, safe <laughs> area. So we have we have some challenges. Uh how did you look at the COVID area real quick and say, I'm gonna pivot this way? This is what I'm gonna do. I mean it was it was tough. It was frustrating. It was a little unreal. I mean, I, I joke, you know, I remember when, uh, you know, some of the gigs were first getting canceled right at the start of the pandemic. And, you know, me and a couple of friends would be sitting around and be like, oh, man, we're going to lose a couple of weeks of work. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> uh, it ended up being a lot more than that. I mean, I I kind of very early on, you know, started refocusing myself. I mean, I was able to pivot pretty well because for a couple of reasons. First of all, I was able, I do online teaching as well. You know, I do teaching and I was able to kind of get some more online teaching, both in terms of private students. But another thing I do a lot is I do lots of like music lecturing uh, for senior groups, lifelong learning. I've done those kind of classes for years for Johns Hopkins, like lifelong learning, Towson University, stuff like that. And when the pandemic hit, uh, suddenly there became a big demand to do that kind of stuff virtually. And I, I got contacted by by senior groups and synagogues and, and other kind of lifelong learning programs uh, to do that sort of thing. And of course, when you're doing it virtually, you can be doing it anywhere. So I would get, you know, I, I started doing that for people all around the country. Um, so that was a nice thing. Um, I was also fortunate in that I have two teenagers. Uh, so they really helped me uh with the technology aspect of things uh i'm not terrible with technology but i'm not a whiz either uh and they really helped me with all the you know the videos and the audio and zoom and different recording software and live streaming and you know they helped me really figure a lot of that out uh 
if I hadn't had them in house, you know, that would have been difficult. And as I like to say, they're like the perfect IT professionals. They have the yeah, makings yeah. of great IT because they they're very knowledgeable and very helpful. But they do it with that little little undertone of condescending, patronizing that that really makes them the perfect IT professionals. Uh, I'm kidding, but they were they were great. But now yeah. you're I, I know exactly what you're talking about. We didn't know what kids were for until yeah. technology came. We really needed them. But they're always like, I can't believe you don't know this. Like that attitude. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, anyway. I was able to do stuff during the pandemic. Now, did it make up for all the lost income? No, no, of course it didn't. It made up for some, and then there were some grant programs and you know different uh, awards and stuff and government you know funding that began to surface. You know, once you were a few months into the pandemic, and I was able to tap into that as well. So, I mean, income dropped during the pandemic. It did. That's that's undeniable. Uh, but it didn't disappear completely. I was able to make up for some of the lost income, and that was, you know, that was huge. TikTok, uh, the other streaming was. There's so many that I I'm not aware of. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, do you having the kids help you? Do you feel that you're in those mediums? Uh, Instagram, uh, you know, the Twitter. I'm some the... of them. I mean, it's like I said, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a spring chicken anymore, so I'm a little slow to the sum of this stuff. I, I, you know, among my peer group, I kind of feel like, again, I'm in that middle. I'm not on the cutting edge of technology and social media, but I'm not at the bottom of the heap either. So, you know, I'm, I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty good. My Facebook game is pretty good. I'm pretty on top of that. I got that mastered. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I don't think my Instagram game is that good. I've started doing some stuff on TikTok. I'm not really on this on uh, on top of that as much as I should be. I mean, it's all a lot to handle. So I'm doing what I can, uh, but uh, you know, it's always a struggle. And you know, look, I'm, I'm in my forties. Uh, I think, I, I feel like there should be a law that once you reach the age of 40, all technology should freeze for you. No more software updates, no more equipment updates, you know, once you're 40 years old, what you're using technologically then should just exist for the rest of your life. Of course, that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my target audience, well, it became like 45 to 65. They're just not, you know, Facebook is where they're at. You know, yeah, I, I, yeah. Could, I, I could go on other uh, platforms and thank God I don't because it's a waste of time, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like I'll do Instagram, but I don't follow it. Myself. I don't go on because I don't like it. So like, but I'll post my stuff. So it's hard. Um, okay. So this is one myth. Like if you could tell anything to any of the audience, uh, like some, something that they should know about. I, I have one for you. It's like, don't ask for free tickets because, yeah. <laughs> because, and, and uh, I've worked at live in the world cafe in the past. I was always hooked up for shows in jazz world. I, I, there are people are like, why are you like getting free get tickets? I said, because they need the money. Like they, they can't give out free tickets. I mean, they can, but that defeats the purpose of, of you coming to a show. Look there it's independent artists definitely need support. You know, there's no question about it. And look, if you're financially able, if you're in a good position financially, support them financially buy tickets even if you can't go to the show buy tickets you know buy their albums download tip them patreon whatever whatever the medium support them financially now look not everyone can support the artists they love financially and i totally get that and sympathize but then there are lots of non-financial ways you can support them like their posts share their posts comments subscribe to them on as many channels you know add them to spotify playlists you know so there, there's so many ways to support the artists you love now either financially or non-financially so again if you're able to support them financially it's great but even if you're not one of the nice things about the internet age is there's many ways you can help out the artists you love without even spending any money. It just takes a few minutes out of your day to like, comment, share, subscribe on whatever platform you are. And every little bit of that helps when you're an independent artist struggling. We're down to seven minutes left. Do, do you have any comments for future musicians, music, young musicians, musicians? 
Well, I mean, like I said, just be prepared to the fact that you have to be a good business person. It sucks. I wish it weren't so. You know, it didn't come naturally to me. I'm not naturally, I wasn't naturally that organized. I wasn't naturally that business, business savvy, but I had to, I had to learn it. I had to go, become that way. You know, um, I, my understanding is I think the music programs and schools and stuff are getting better at, at teaching that stuff and imparting that knowledge. Uh, but you got to learn that stuff one way or the other, either on your own or in a formal setting or whatever. But, you know, unless you are fortunate enough to be the top, you know, 0.01%, you're gonna have to be a business person. That's just a reality. There's no use complaining about it. There's no use whining about it. If you don't like that, you might have to find another line of work. It's just, yeah. it's just a reality. Yeah, there was a, a part where, you know, if I look back at it, I'd rather have a business degree. And then I, at least I knew the business side. I knew what to expect in general. And then turn around and be creative in, in the field. Yeah. Yeah. I, I joke, I have a friend, again, I won't, I won't out anyone, but I have a friend who actually has a master's in economics uh, from a very good university. And he's a jazz pianist. And I always ki kid him. I'm like, isn't the first... 30 seconds of the first class on the first day of an economics degree, don't become a jazz pianist. That seems like that would be the first lesson. It comes in handy though. I mean, it really does. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I find that, you know, it's, it's uh, being, you know, out there in the social world, you're like, Hey, I'm Seth Kaibo. I got a, I got a band. I got this. And like, you're constantly uh, self-promoting. Yep. Uh, I don't know. There's people on the street. I'll stop them and tell them I got a podcast, blah, blah, blah. Uh, th that that took a long time for me to to get to that point. But, uh, you know, it's just that it becomes like the handshake, the two minute drill of, of introducing yourself and, and who you are and uh, get those business cards out. Look, uh, d d just real quick to do what we do, musician, podcaster, what whatever there has to be at least some small element of narcissism. And, and I mean that in a good way. I mean, we're both saying, hey, we're creating something that has value and that people should stop their lives and appreciate. And that's inherently a little bit narcissistic. Now, I think that's, that's good narcissism, but I mean, that's a pretty egotistical thing to say. So you have to have that kind of self-confidence or at least you know, uh, uh, convince yourself you have that self-confidence. Say, hey, I'm producing something of value and people I don't even know should be consuming what I'm producing. You know, yeah. that's that that requires a little bit of stroking of the ego. Yeah, definitely. And and if you think about it, there's so many uh, venues or, or streams that people can get entertainment from and you know, a, a podcast is something new for a lot of people as of yeah. five years ago. So the fact that they actually listen to one is crazy. A lot of people don't even know what they are. So, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I don't have any more questions. Um, I think we hit everything. I really appreciate you doing this. You know that I'm a big fan. I think that the next thing is uh, historical jazz podcast. You know, we're going Ooh, through. I like that. that. That's for you, not me. But well, I think that. Yeah. I just, cause we're running out of time. Let me just say, you know, and, and you know, I love you, but I just want to say this on the podcast, man, stuff like what you're doing. This is part of the independent artist ecosystem, you know, independent musicians, independent artists, uh, like myself can't survive and thrive without independent methods of promotion. And that's you. Uh, that's the type of thing you're doing. So we're, we're kind of in this symbiotic relationship. You know, we're all part of this same new world, this new artistic ecosystem that's changing and morphing and metamorphosizing on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I'm not, I'm creating off of your creation. You know, I'm actually like, that's what I, how I look at it. I'm taking what you're doing and I'm bringing it to people and saying, hey, you know, I, this is his work. I'm actually, you know, promoting it for you. That's why I kind of consider that as, you know what, this was fun. I'm going to post this yep. on YouTube uh, raw and then we're going to, 
it'll go on later today so people can take a listen to it awesome and that and then uh we're looking at february march that we clean this up a little we'll do a, a polite intro outro we're going to play some of your music we'll talk about you but uh you're always perfect as always there's no reason to to edit we're going to just put it up <laughs> late put it up later today well thanks tom good talking yeah. to you as always yeah great thank you i'm gonna hit, hit uh stop